those who go down this path risk prison time or even death. But when you understand that the alternative is to condemn our children and future generations to an open-air prison, the moral imperative is clear. Protests are toothless. They channel discontent into a public display that has little or no impact on the system. Color revolution tactics, on the other hand, have been used by intelligence agencies to topple governments all around the world. Like any weapon, it can be used for evil or a higher cause. In a way, we have done the same that they did in Belgrade in the 90s. Non-violent resistance, the ridicule of the regime. There was no violence on the street. Even when the police intervened, we did not fight. The people from Otpor gave us a book in which they described all their strategies, how you have to proceed when you want to overthrow a regime. That book, which is used by opposition movements worldwide, was actually written in Boston, USA. From dictatorship to democracy is considered the Bible of the non-violent resistance. Though often attributed to Gene Sharp and his book From Dictatorship to Democracy, this approach is really just an application of the psychological principles first described by Gustave Le Bon, further developed by Edward Pernays. Color revolutions are organized in three layers. The first layer is comprised of strategists and coordinators who understand the principles involved and which are responsible for training and equipping the individuals who are to represent the public face of the movement. These representatives who comprise the second layer don't have to be charismatic leaders. Ordinary citizens can fill the role. However, in order to be effective, they must be both brave and respectable. For example, an old woman who is not afraid for herself may be more appropriate than a young man who lacks self-control. The third layer is made up of those who already support the cause, but lack the knowledge or experience to plan effective actions on their own. These are the masses that are already protesting in the streets. The first challenge for the organizers is to define the central message of the movement and distill these ideas down to a small number of memorable slogans that touch upon a moral and emotional core. Crowds are not moved by complex ideological discourse. The rallying cry must be primal and absolute. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Second challenge is to develop visual cues to unify the movement. This might include symbols, flags, or even clothing items of a particular color. This is where the term color revolution originates. This visual identity must be adapted to the history of the region. For example, during the French Revolution, the resistance identified themselves by wearing the Phrygian cap, or bonnet rouge. This red conical hat with the tip pulled forward was a style of hat that was given to slaves in ancient Rome when they had earned their freedom. And at one point, it was used by a populist leader to incite a slave insurrection. So the way you're doing it nonviolent struggle is actually you create this group identity. You want people to feel each other. You want people to be dressed in a similar clothes. You want people to sing because songs make them work together. You, you want to have drums there who will give the rhythm to your march. You want whistles, you want music, you want fun. This is a very important part. And now it looks like a big, you know, uh, how do you call it, love parade. The Egyptians followed Serda's rules exactly and succeeded. <laughs> The whole world was watching as the people celebrated on Tahrir Square. The regime was powerless. If it had reacted with violence, it would have lost face in front of the whole international media. Third challenge is to stage an event that neither the public or the media can ignore. This event must be highly disruptive and employ nonviolent civil disobedience to provoke the authorities. The explicit goal is to push them to brutality and capture that brutality on film. This is why courage is so important. In order to be effective, the frontline representatives must be willing to endure violence without returning it. Examples of this principle can be found in the actions staged by Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Non-retaliation is important for two reasons. 
One-sided brutality evokes outrage among the general public. It destroys the moral authority of those in power and can be used to shame the enforcers, pressuring them to turn. This is another reason why an elderly woman can sometimes be more effective on the front line than a young man. To strike such a person is socially unacceptable. This provides an opportunity to challenge officers up close and personal, condemning their complicity and demanding that they stand with the people. There are many kinds of disruptive action that can be taken in such operations, but it is important that the target be chosen carefully with a mind towards who will be most inconvenienced and what message such a disruption would send. For example, blocking traffic on a random road may merely frustrate the public without making any relevant point. A better target would be a business or institution which is discriminating based on medical status, a large grocery store or train station, for example. To maximize impact, the operation should be designed to last long enough to cause significant problems. If a building is to be occupied, it must be done in such a way that the police cannot easily remove the protesters. This is often accomplished by chaining doors shut and chaining participants to each other and to the infrastructure. The initial target should be a low-hanging fruit, an operation with a high probability of success. Though the event may force a change in policy, the real objective is to reach the hearts and minds of the public and to encourage insubordination within the police and military. One commander refusing to enforce an order can set off a chain reaction that exposes the impotence of the political class and brings an end to the state. To many, this course of action would sound extreme. The risk too great, the price too high to pay. Unfortunately, the window for nonviolent action was closing and the base case scenario was outright war. Europe is in the midst of an uprising of the unvaccinated, pitting citizens who refuse to get the jab against governments that want the pandemic to end. And neither side is backing down. There is no easy way out. This is the test of our generation. Neutrality is complicity. Those who cling to life will lose it. So if you're the praying type, pray. If you're not, you might want to start. The forces of evil are real. So is the other side. And each and every one of us has to choose.